Hello, I'm Daisy Cousins. Welcome to This Week in Social Justice. This week's biggest and baddest social justice fails include Prince Harry, Meghan Markle and the hypocrisy of the elite climate change aficionados, why Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is making fun of middle America and the Electoral College again, and depending on how long I feel like talking about the first two topics, we may even get time for a bonus topic. So let's get started. But while I have your attention, if you like this video, pretty please share it for me. YouTube is no longer recommending independent content creators, so if you like this and other videos of mine and think that other people would like them too, then please smash that share button. I would really, really appreciate it if you did that. Okay, here we go. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have attracted allegations of hypocrisy over their apparent penchant for travelling in private jets. The royal pair have both been outspoken advocates for radical climate change action in recent times, which is why many, many eyebrows were firmly raised when it was revealed that they took four trips on private jets in just 11 days. The first was a trip to the glamorous party island of Ibiza on August 6 to celebrate Meghan's 38th birthday, and the second was a trip to Nice to stay at Elton John's private villa from which the royal couple arrived back last Sunday. Now, bear in mind, private jets emit more tons of carbon dioxide per person than your average commercial flight. Their first trip is estimated to have generated about six times more carbon dioxide per person than a scheduled flight, and the second trip generated an estimated seven times more emissions per person. As such, it seems a little bit rich that Meghan and Harry are positing themselves as climate change warriors for good. And trust me, there is nothing that normal people are more done with than rich, famous people who possess a do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do attitude. So, what does this lack of leadership by example from the Duke and Duchess of Sussex entail? Well, in the case of Prince Harry, he recently did an interview with climate change activist Dr Jane Goodall for the September issue of British Vogue, in which he revealed that he and Meghan did not plan on having more than two children because to do so would apparently be bad for the planet. It. Megan was, in fact, the guest editor of that edition of Vogue and picked teen climate superstar campaigner Greta Thunberg to be on the front cover as one of Megan's chosen forces for change. Prince Harry also spoke last year in Sydney during the Invictus Games at the Australian Geographic Society Awards on the dangers of climate change, spurring viewers on in their quest to save the planet. My father and others have been speaking about the environment for decades not basing it on fallacy or new age hypothesis, but rooted in science and facts, and the sobering awareness of our environmental vulnerability. And while those speeches would sometimes fall on deaf ears, he and others were unrelenting in their commitment to preserve the most valuable resource we have, our planet. He also attended a very interesting event at the end of July this year at the famous Verdura Resort known as Google Summer Camp. The A-listers only three-day congregation is organized by Google co-founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin, and the guest list included, as well as Prince Harry, former President Barack Obama, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Katy Perry, to name just a few. All attended this annual deluxe climate chat brimful of enthusiasm at the prospect of saving the world. However, it seems that, like Harry and Meghan, these global elites have a little trouble practicing what they preach. The Italian press reported that 114 private jets were expected to show up to the resort, which would have projected 100,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Along with the gas-guzzling private jets were a number of gas-guzzling private yachts. And as for Prince Harry, although he gave an impassioned speech to VIPs and power brokers, barefoot for emphasis, it was claimed Google paid for his flights and a helicopter to the resort where he is alleged to have stayed on one of those gas-guzzling luxury super yachts. Wow. See why there are so many eyebrows raising further and further up at the super-rich and their somewhat checkered climate change activism, shall we say? But to be fair, we cannot ignore Elton John's defense of the royals at their use of a private jet to travel to and from his villa. 
In an Instagram post, he implored the press to stop the attacks on Meghan and Harry because he had offered them the jet because of their security needs and he had made the appropriate payment to Carbon Footprint, which is a company that allows you to proverbially offset your carbon emissions, thus making their trip carbon neutral. Hmm. So what is this carbon offsetting of which Sir Elton speaks? Well, companies like Carbon Footprint calculate people's carbon usage, then allow them to make a monetary contribution to a program that will somehow negate it. These programs can be things like reforestation, renewable energy, and so on. Now, that sounds like a good solution for the carbon conscious, right? And surely a way to negate Harry and Meghan's apparent hypocrisy. However, there are many issues with carbon offsetting. According to Roger Tyers, a research fellow at the University of Southampton, the idea that you can fly carbon neutral is very misleading. That is, a plane that flies today emits carbon well, today. It is very hard to know how fast an offset can remove that amount of carbon from the atmosphere. In addition, the process of carbon offsetting is notoriously complicated. There is no agreement on how much carbon dioxide a journey may emit, and there's confusion about what process can most effectively reduce emissions, and an inflated amount of choices of where you can direct your money. There is also a lot of cynicism about the principle itself because airlines, airports and big corporations use offsetting to sell more flights or get permission to grow even further. And yes, while some people argue quite reasonably that carbon offsetting is better than doing nothing, others disagree, saying it simply allows frequent flyers to assuage their guilt and that the aviation industry will continue to grow as a result. This sneakily backhands in the long term the idea of carbon offsetting in the first place. So while we should appreciate the thought, it seems Elton John's excuse doesn't quite cut the mustard for the two people who are so hell-bent on flexing their climate change muscles on such a large and self-righteous scale. The other problem with carbon offsetting is that it requires disposable income, sometimes quite a lot depending on your carbon footprint. While that may be okay for high income earners, people on a middle class or lower income with mouths to feed and bills to pay are certainly not going to be thinking about carbon offsetting or green energy or any of that stuff the elites keep insisting the little people engage in while sneering at them when they don't. And that's the problem with so many radical climate change activists, famous or not. They actually generally have the funds to live the emissions-free lifestyle they tout. Your average Joe or Jolene just can't do that. Climate change activists tend to be from the progressive class who, according to a 2018 study of America's political landscape called Hidden Tribes, are most likely to be earning a salary of $100,000 US dollars or more per year. As such, they can afford the higher power prices that come with renewable energy. They can afford to have their income slashed in half by taxes and not lose much of a quality of life as a result. And for those young people who are part of the climate alarmist ranks, well, they're more often than not university students who collect government benefits and expect to be taken care of by the state anyway. Or in the case of, say, Greta Thunberg and her adolescent-led climate movement, their children and teenagers whose parents feed them and pay the bills. None of these activists have any concept of the real world and the ramifications of large-scale climate change action. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her Green New Deal are a good example of this ignorance. As these gilets jaunes or yellow vest protesters in France said of Macron and his cronies when they proposed a fuel tax, the elites are thinking about the end of the world, whereas the yellow vests and those they represent are thinking about the end of the month. Huge, huge social justice fail for Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, and the rest of the climate change enthusiast elites. Speaking of Alexandria Ocasio Red Cortez, she has once again proved she's learned nothing from the Democrats losing the 2016 election by her latest rallying against Middle America via the Electoral College. In an Instagram story on August 20th, she filmed her journey as she traveled in a gas guzzling car through empty fields in which she offered some interesting commentary. All right, everyone, it's been a minute. We're coming to you live from the Electoral College many votes here as you can see very efficient way to choose leadership of the country um i mean i can't think of any other way can you 
she followed up this sarcastic little video by posting that the Electoral College is a scam, citing an article from the Intelligencer entitled, Here's Every Defense of the Electoral College and Why They're All Wrong. Finally, and in true Red Cortez style, she somehow made the existence of the Electoral College an issue of racism. The Electoral College has a racial injustice breakdown. Due to several racial disparities in certain states, the Electoral College effectively weighs white voters over voters of color, as opposed to a one-person, one-vote system where all our votes are counted equally. <sighs> okay, so we all know what's really going on here. The reason Red Cortez and so many other Democrats have repeatedly argued that the Electoral College be eliminated is because they lost the 2016 election because of it. That is, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, so she got the most votes via the population, but Donald Trump won the whole thing because he won the Electoral College. That is, while he got less votes population-wise, more states went red than blue. And as each state gets a certain amount of Electoral College votes based on population, that is what got him over the finish line. So I guarantee you that if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016 by losing the popular vote but winning the Electoral College, the Democrats would be praising the Electoral College to the skies. This has nothing to do with them trying to make the system fairer. On the contrary, in fact. The purpose of the Electoral College, at least this is my understanding of it, is to protect the interests of smaller, less populated states from getting drowned out repeatedly by the issues of the more densely populated coastal states. In that respect, and in a country like the USA, which has a population of 325 million people, which is a lot, the Electoral College makes perfect sense. And yes, I would be saying that if the Democrats had won in 2016 because of it. I am nothing if not fair. The thing is, if the president was decided by the popular vote alone, the Democrats would likely win every single election because those densely populated coastal states tend to lean reliably left. As such, it is very clear that Red Cortez and the rest of them don't actually care about a fair vote or democracy or representing everyone's interests. They just care about power and are willing to do anything to obtain it. Enormous social justice fail right here. Bonus topic! We have a bonus topic this week. In what is essentially a rebuke of social justice, TV host, journalist and noted leftist Piers Morgan has launched an astonishingly blunt yet uh, somewhat insightful condemnation of the modern left. During an interview with former gun laws debate opponent Ben Shapiro for Turning Point UK, dear Piers had this to say. Populism what? is rising because liberals have become unbearable. And I speak as a liberal, okay? I, in my core, I'm probably more liberal than not. Although fundamentally, I see myself as a journalist and I'd like to see both sides of all these things. And I can argue both. But liberals have become utterly, pathetically illiberal. And it's a massive problem. What's the point of calling yourself a liberal if you don't allow anyone else to have a different view? You know, this snowflake culture that we know operate in, the victimhood culture, the, you know, everyone is, has to think a certain way, behave a certain way, everyone has to you know, have a bleeding heart and tell you 20 things that are wrong with them. And you know, I just think it's all completely skewed to an environment where everyone's offended by everything. Wow, wow, wow. Now, I think we all knew that Piers, as an old-fashioned lefty and a friend of Donald Trump pre-presidency, was fed up with the Social Justice Brigade, but I didn't realize he felt this strongly about it. So this is less of a social justice fail and more of a social justice indictment by a man who, despite his flaws, is remarkably based for a media guy. Piers Morgan, you done good. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my Subscribestar link and other ways you can support me.